to. Um, and this is my, so my comments apply to myself as much as yourself. As you work through your emotional injuries, your vasectomy will be automatically restored. And you, when you get into a point of abundance with God, all of your physical body problems will be, you can heal yourself anyway. So the vasectomy itself will be healed. It certainly does impair the function, but it impairs the function more from the emotional condition than from the actual act of having the vasectomy. So, it's all, so that's why it's immeasurable from a doctor's perspective, because the emotions were present before you had the vasectomy anyway. So it's the same emotions again. So it's dealing with the emotions that cause you to want to do that, that need to be released and worked through. And once they're worked through, your body has the ability to heal that part of your body anyway. Yeah. Again, it's something I've had to pray about with God about uh, repentance, about also looking at the issue of modifying my body for the sake of my own emotions. And uh, it's the same kind of thing that a woman would go through with many different things with regard to breast implants and other things like that too you go through these kind of emotions of modifying your body. The truth actually is, ladies, that as you deal with the emotions inside of you, your breast will get to what is their designed size, if you like, all right? And if your breasts are far too large, it's, it's usually because of over-nurturing emotions. If your breasts are undersized, it's due to generally under-nurturing types of emotions. And as you work through those intergender type emotions, you'll find that your body shape will change. So, don't go out and buy a whole new wardrobe now. <laughs> no, of course you can buy them whenever you want. I was just going to say too that in my first marriage, I, I pressured my wife into having a tubal ligation. Yep. And that's another... And hence the guilt about the vasectomy. Yeah, yeah. So it was the guilt driving the vasectomy from that pressuring. Yeah. Ian, other back, thanks. Diagnosed with, diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer five years ago. Yep. I had surgery four years ago. Yep. And uh, my PSA counts for zero. Uh, so I've been cured of cancer, but I've lost my prostate. Yep. So um, I assume what the same because some errors in my early regulation to Yes, certainly. So the key is to allow yourself to work through some of those areas that are to do with how you view yourself as a male. It's due to previous relationships with females and how you viewed yourself as a male. And so allow yourself to work through those particular injuries and you'll find it's to do with your mother relationship actually and how you view yourself as a result. If you can allow yourself to work through those injuries, you'll find actually your prostate will grow again and, as, and when you become a one with God, it will restore its normal function. Wow. I've some work <laughs> <laughs> You and me both. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I, have a, is it on? I have a comment and a question. And the comment is for you, Mary, regarding the French woman that you met. And I saw a program about a month ago on 2020 from America. And there are women that are having that experience of orgasms with childbirth. And it's from completely relaxing around the experience. And it just sounds just fantastic. I mean, this new wave of awareness. And they were kind of like going, whoa, you know, they're rolling their eyes and all this. But they also presented it. And it went all over the planet. And I've, I've seen a film before about women in Russia doing this very same thing. And they're just allowing the beauty of that experience to happen. So uh, that's the comment. And the question is, what about in vitro fer fertilization? Can you comment on that? Um, yeah, we can. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's probably getting a bit off the sex and sexuality thing and into some other sort of discussions about what, you know, what is the right thing to do about different choices that we make regarding child rearing and child bearing. But uh, just briefly, um, if a person cannot get pregnant in, a, in the standard method, shall we call it, um, there is emotions that both the husband and the wife need to look at identifying. Now, 
having any medical procedure, all that does is ignore the fact that the emotions are creating the problem. Do you follow me? And so my suggestion is to look at the causes of the problem rather than looking at whether these procedures are right or wrong in themselves, but rather look at the cause of the issue. The cause of the issue is, if it's a male infertility, it's to do with his issues with regard to his emotions, that probably again transgenerational emotions that have entered him that he needs to look at releasing. And if, it, if, it's, if infertility is on the side of the woman, then it, she needs to do the same thing. Now, usually when they do that, and there are many times when people have said that they couldn't get pregnant, they've gone and had an adoption or had an in, in vitro fertilization, and then the second one they've got pregnant naturally. And the reason why is during this process they've often worked through some of the emotion regarding why they couldn't get pregnant in the first place. My suggestion is to deal with the emotional causes right from that time moment. What about the multiple births that are happening? Like somebody just had eight. Where are the souls on that? I mean, well, they're all separate uh, soul incarnations occurring into the eight children. Many of those multiple births, though, occur through through abnormalities or through fer um, what do they call it? Fertilization type drugs. And the problem with taking any drugs, of course, is going to be that it modifies the physiological function without condition without a reference to the soul condition. And so my suggestion is always go back to the soul condition rather than trying to modify something at a physiological function level. When you do that, you're just ignoring the soul condition. So, so allow yourself to go back to looking at the emotional reasons as to why you can't get pregnant before taking fertilization drugs which help you get pregnant. Look at the emotional reasons as to why you can't. Or look at if there's a constant stream of miscarriages occurring, Look at the emotional reasons why those miscarriages might be occurring. Allow yourself to look at these things emotionally. That's the key thing to do. And, and first down there. Um, AJ and Mary, um, I had, um, when I was younger, I also had very severe period pains. And um, when I was younger, um, I have a lot of trouble about my sexuality. Uh, that came from my mother in particular. And um, I didn't know whether I was a male or a female. And I resented very much that a woman had to have periods and the males seemed to be all spot free. Mm -hmm. and, Big emotion, girls. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, but when I realised, but I didn't know if I went through any emotional things, but when I realised that I actually hated being a woman and accepted it, um, my period pains went away. Um, but the actual question is that um, you asked before, AJ, about who, did, who doesn't like sex and things like that. Um, having had quite a um, promiscuous type of lifestyle, um, uh, and also practicing spiritual directions. Um, I come to a point in my life where I felt I didn't need it. And um, I've enjoyed it, sort of, but I felt I don't need it, I don't have any wish for it. Yeah. So my question is, is this related back to my, is that the era that perhaps um, so we're just going to keep going with on the general outline that we've we've given you, um, and just wanted to remind everyone that today is almost the introductory sort of groundwork that we're doing about sex and sexuality, um, and a lot of people have been asking about um, individual issues, which I understand, and that's also really relevant. But probably today we're just going to be addressing some broader general things um, and then in our next section, session on section, sexuality we'll talk more specifically about specific injuries and different uh, techniques in order to work through those injuries. 
So, um, I think where AJ wanted to start off right now was the, the section on the second side of your outline, which is about injuries with sexual identity causes our law of attraction to attract. Lots of interesting things. Or, or you could say lots of very distressing things. Couldn't you, really? Um, how many of you have experienced sexual abuse in your life? Can I just have... Wow, so that's like two-thirds, probably? Three, two-thirds, probably, of our room. There's over 100 people here, so that's quite a lot of people, isn't it? Now, a lot of times we ask ourselves, well, how did that happen to me? Well, how it happened to us is that our parents did not resolve their sexual injuries. That's how it happened. And the reason why that happens is like that is because when our parents don't resolve their sexual injuries, they actually attract events to themselves which cause them to trigger those injuries. And for many of our parents, they've also been abused sexually. Or they have sexual shame issues to work through or sexual guilt issues to work through and so forth. And unfortunately, when they have a child, those children automatically have that imprint of those emotions on them. And so that's why, as children, we often attract those kind of abuse issues. So anything to do with sexual control, sexual powerlessness, sexual abuse of our own children, or sexual abuse generally to ourselves, all of those events are law of attraction events that are there to help us work through some sexual abuse issues within ourselves or sexual identity issues within ourselves. Unfortunately, because there's a lot of spirits involved in the whole process, often what happens with sexual abuse is spirits get involved in the sexual abuse process. So of all of you who have been sexually abused, when, it, when you were little, how many of you noticed the spirits who were involved in the process? Can I just have the hands there? So only one. And yet, in every single case, spirits were involved in that process of sexual abuse. So, um, the issue that we often face is that we lose our spirit connection with abuse as well. Does that make sense? If you, you feel the person going into a different state, the person who's abusing you going into a different state that's actually influenced by spirits, what happens is you also become very afraid of feeling what those spirits are feeling as well. Now, all of these things occur because of the law of attraction of the parents' sexual injuries. So can you see how important it is as parents to work through our sexual injuries? Because it, it, it assists us greatly and assists our children greatly in having a sexual identity that isn't harmed by these kind of events. I was just going to say the next point is about uh, further to that other spirit sort of influence that might influence us into unloving uh, sexual practices with other people. So if we have a specific injury or a needy feeling within us, then we're, we can be quite susceptible to spirits that want to use us then, if, if they want to experience sex, use us to enter um, interactions with people, sexual interactions with people that may not be loving. Um, if I can give you an example of this, uh, a few weeks ago I met a man, so let's draw the man. <laughs> All right, he has a spirit with him or a group of spirits with him who are interested in, the, he's very mediumistic this man, he has a group of spirits who are just interested in setting him up for sexual encounters. That's all they're interested in doing with him. So what happens is he walks along the road and here's a pretty woman, maybe dressed a little better than that, but, and, and if she has a certain type of injury, this spirit influence this woman to notice this man. And usually within one day, they're in bed. So he has had a string of conquests, I suppose you could say. He has this mojo with women. <laughs> Should we call it that? Which actually isn't mojo, it's actually spirit influenced. Influencing him and influencing the woman with a certain type of injury. And the woman mostly being influenced with the injury is She's quite needy for physical touch. 
she's quite needy for physical affection, and she's also she also wants a man in her life who really takes note of her, notice of her sexually and physically <coughs> and emotionally. All of which he does to get a person into bed. So what are his emotions? So his emotions are, he really feels quite powerless sexually. But what's happening is these spirits have connected to that powerless emotion sexually and what they're doing is they're giving him sexual power. Do you follow me? And so he is unwilling to feel this emotion and on top of that he's willing to actually break a lot of God's laws about love to enter the sexual union. So he's not concerned about having long-term relationships with these women. He's only concerned with getting them into bed so that he can feel better about himself sexually. Does that make sense? And every new woman he, can, he, he pl completes the conquest of, he feels better about himself. Ironically, he doesn't though. Because unfortunately, it's not real, is it? It's driven by these groups of spirits. So talking to him was quite interesting because he felt that he was actually under the control. He, he felt that he was controlling these spirits. He knew they were there with him, and he knew often what they were doing. But he felt he was under the he was under control of them. But in reality, they are completely controlling him through this emotion of sexual powerlessness. What about the woman? The woman's, yeah, the woman's again influenced as well by these spirits. And, uh, and the woman is influ influenced by different emotions that she needs somebody to show her sexual attention and to feel loved. So for the women it's about the fact that they actually feel unloved and they actually don't want to feel that emotion. So the whole interaction with the man is also a law of attraction for them because they end up feeling unloved. So what happens? He has sex with them and then within a week generally breaks the relationship and within a week they want to marry him generally and a, and a few days after that obviously he wants to break up the relationship <laughs> and, and so they feel abandoned and unloved. So that's their law of attraction. They're attracting this whole interaction in order to feel those things. Now, can you see in all of that interaction, like, if you were the man, can you see how you might start thinking, oh, this is pretty good, I can't get any woman I want in bed, you know, and you can start feeling quite good about yourself, and I'm, you know, you can see yourself doing that. And it's all actually influenced by an emotion that you're trying to avoid in the end. So is she feeling generally unloved? Is she feeling generally unloved or is it a daddy issue? It's a daddy issue, certainly. It's a male issue. Yep, certainly. Now, why would he be feeling sexually uh, powerless in the first place? Uh, because he has a mum issue. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you see how it all relates? Yeah, what kind of mum issue? The kind of mum issue is that, uh, or in, in his case, well, I probably don't like to be too specific about his emotions. Um, he may finish up watching this DVD, so he can ask me personally. Um, but generally, if a person's feeling sexually powerless, it's because in their interactions with their mother when they were little, they were constantly being overridden, constantly being pulled into line, constantly being not allowed to express their free will, but in specifically with their mother. In with their father, they generally were allowed to. Does that make sense? And oftentimes they did receive sexual projections from their mother in the sense of, like, their mother might have been projecting at them sexually to be the ideal man. Does that make sense? And so then they grow up feeling like they're not the ideal man. They're always being pulled into line. So now they want to have a powerful feeling. And spirits love those kind of connections. Because spirits, many spirits in the first sphere are feeling totally powerless until they can connect with the person on earth and start expressing their power through that person. So is it worth pointing out that without the spirits, the same interaction would still be happening, just to a lesser, with less potency, if you like? 
So it's still the law of attraction acting with the spirits and it's still the person's emotional injuries that's driving the interactions. So in other words, like Mary said, if that spirit wasn't there, this man still got that emotion and this woman still got these emotions, but they haven't got spirits scanning around for them <laughs> and hooking them up anymore, so there would be far less of those kind of interactions. But because the spirit's involved, that heightens the emotions and causes these events to happen far more rapidly, which is actually good in the sense, because it means that hopefully at some point he'll deal with that emotion and hopefully she at some point will deal with the unloved emotion. Does that make sense? And it causes those events to happen quite rapidly. That's one of the things you, if that happens, where you know, all of a sudden different events seem to occur where people are coming in your life and they want to have sex with you. <laughs> Not many people in that. <laughs> if that happens, usually spirit driven. Okay. Is there any questions about that? Hey Jane, Mary, what happens if you consciously are engaged in, so it's, um, a really conscious sexual encounter with someone else on planet Earth, not a spirit, yep. and you set it up so you um, ask only the celestial spirits to be with you, and that isn't there a way of <laughs> isn't there a way of being much more conscious about what we're doing um, and asking for somebody much higher than a a grotty old spirit who's um, <laughs> kind of left on the old energy, you know? <laughs> so in other words, you want a celestial spirit to set you up. You know, from the old paradigm, you ask for the white light to surround you, you know, the metaphysical... And can I just take you from that, though, for a yes. moment? As soon as you're asking for a white light to surround you, you are not dealing with the issue emotionally. If you deal with the issue emotionally, you don't have to ask for protection at all because you automatically have protection. Because once the emotion's relieved from you, then you automatically have protection. So the better thing to ask is to ask God, not a spirit. Remember, this is all about your connection with God and not spirits. Ask God to assist you to deal with your own emotions regarding your sexual injuries so that you can attract the person who's and, and, and attract the people that are going to help you to do that. You can certainly ask God to do that. Okay, yeah, that, that makes it clearer. Thanks, so, AJ. But you certainly don't want to surround yourself with white light and stuff. The reason why is because as soon as you do that, you certainly put a protective barrier around yourself, right? But you're also protecting yourself from your own emotion. And in the end, it's your emotions that are attracting all of these things. And so you can surround yourself with white light as much as you want, but in the end of the day, you're going to have to do it every day. And what I'm trying to teach you is get into a state where you don't have to do any of those things at all, and your life is perfect as a result of actually dealing with all the emotions. Does that make sense to everyone? Rather than going into this state of protecting yourself from the emotions, which is actually going to cause your emotions to stay in you, and attract these events for, for a longer time. Because sex is emotional in the end anyway. So it's just like all of the other things in our life. Um, instead of avoiding the emotion, go into the emotion. And if the law of attraction is bringing us a yucky sexual experience, then it is our law of attraction. So we need to go into it. Not necessarily the sexual act again. Not the sexual <laughs> Emotionally, act. go into the emotion. <laughs> You understand what Mary's saying? Into it emotionally. Yeah. So if you just got abused by a man sexually, that doesn't mean go back to him because that's your law of attraction, but rather feel your emotion about the event. Go through it emotionally. Yeah. And the next point on the list, I think, is um, when, our law of, when we have sexual injuries, our law of attraction brings us perhaps difficulties or a lack of uh, orgasm or sexual response. So, so how many of you have, and this is a personal question ladies and you don't have to put up your hand if you don't want to. <laughs> how many of you ladies find it difficult to orgasm? Just, I'm not ladies. <laughs> uh, 
together, and there's a lot more that on it too. They didn't put up their hand, that's fine. How many of you guys find it difficult to achieve to to remain potent or have a problem with impotence? Okay, so a few. How many of you find that it takes a long time for you to orgasm? Like, not five minutes, but maybe half an hour or longer. Right? How many of you find? How many of you find? Fraser that, is panning the. <laughs> how many of you find that uh, um, when you do orgasm, it doesn't feel satisfactory? How many of you find that uh, when you, like, when you masturbate, it only takes a short time to orgasm, but when you interact with a person, it takes a much longer time to orgasm? Everyone. <laughs> it just seems like suddenly all of these hands went up. There's a lot of spirits holding your hands up. <laughs> it's quite funny, actually. Where did my rubber go? Where did my rubber go? <laughs> I meant that in the fury of rubber. <laughs> All right. Every single sexual problem that we have with regard to impotence, lack of orgasm, time, duration, short, you know, we come too soon or too long, or our enjoyment of all of that, is all to do with emotions. All of it's to do with emotions. It's got nothing to do with your physical body. So the Viagra works because it actually just does something to your physical body, but it doesn't change the soul. So you're going to need to keep taking Viagra. Right? Or whatever other type of drug you may take to enhance the experience. The best way to enhance the experience is to deal with the soul-based emotions that cause the experience to not be as good as it could be. So if your law of attraction is bringing you sexual, a lack of sexual response or, or things being too fast, that you're, anything that annoys you in your sexual life, then look at it sincerely as emotional injuries regarding my sexual identity. Does that make sense? Look at it that way. Now, in the second session, we'll be talking about how to deal with those things. But for now, if you can just be aware of them, because when, when you start being aware of them, it's amazing how things change, even from a day-to-day -day basis. How many of you have found that today sex was good, but in two days' time when you had sex again, it didn't seem to be as good, and you don't really know why? How many of you find that? Quite a few, right? How it seems to fluctuate, ebb and flow, what's going on? What's going on is there's emotions influencing each interaction. Does that make sense? At some point too, you will get to the point where you no longer have a desire for sexual interaction without, with anyone other than your soulmate. So you can actually try to have sex with someone else other than your soulmate, and it will fail every time. That sounds like a really good place to be. It can be quite embarrassing. <laughs> Jen? You're talking from male perspective. I'm talking about female and male perspective. Yep. Both perspectives. Remember, God, God hasn't designed this to be different for the male and different for the female, actually. So, you know, there's one of the biggest misconceptions about sex that's on this planet is that everything is different for the male and different for the female. There are just different emotions inside of each one affecting the sex act. And it's the key is dealing with those emotions. So for a woman, they won't reach a state of arousal with anyone but their soulmate. And for a male, they won't even become erect with anyone other than their soulmate. Um, uh, you, you answered part of the question um, just before I was going to ask about uh, my emotional state one day I'm feeling really good, so I'll have a good sexual experience. And two days later, I'm not feeling very nice, so it's not as good. Yep. But what about hormones? What about women with their cycles and also men? 
do hormones come into play with that at all? It's all emotional. They're all driven by your emotions anyway. So all the hormones, hormones are driven system. by the emotions anyway, even if you are in a menstrual cycle or, yeah? Okay, thank you. I, I, yep, I think my menstrual cycle is totally affected by my emotions. I've experienced that recently as well. The key is that when you focus on the emotions, you'll start noticing why things are changing. When you focus on the physiological response, you don't notice your emotions, and so you don't notice why everything's changing. The key is if you can bring yourself back to every single thing being an emotional issue, you'll soon see what the core is of the emotion, what the core emotion is, because you'll soon, it'll soon come to your mind, generally. Particularly if you pray about it, it generally just comes to your mind straight away. So often, often, We've had to abandon the sex act, myself and Mary, in preference of dealing with the emotion that just comes up. And actually, what's the emotion? Like it might have been anger for her, or it might have been fe my feeling disconnected, or whatever. And we work through the emotion straight away, right there and then. Yeah, and I would say that my sexual experience has altered greatly according when I started dealing with my emotions. So it happens quite rapidly, especially if you remain emotion well, yeah, if you remain emotionally open during sex. So you may remain emotionally open during sex and find this huge rage come apart over you. Now yeah. obviously if you're with a man who's sensitive to that, he's probably not going to keep doing what he's doing, right? <laughs> with you in this huge rage. But allow yourself to feel this huge rage coming over you and connect with what it's about. Even, you can even scream and yell about it. You may have a feeling of pain come over you all of a sudden from, you know, from your sexual organs, for example. Let yourself feel that pain and cry or scream about the pain. Let yourself do that, right? Now, this is where a lot of people don't want to go, isn't it? They want the sex act to be just perfect every time, and so we try to manage that emotionally. But if we just allow the emotions to come up every time, what happens the next time you have sex, it'll be far more pleasurable because that causal emotion has left you. It's like everything on the divine love path, you've just got to give up control. <laughs> sure. Uh, about three years ago, uh, after a breakup uh, with a, a guy, I was given the opportunity to go sailing. But before that, I was kind of praying to God and said, look, I don't want to have sex unless it's great sex. I'm sick of having mediocre sex, so I want great sex. So I went on this uh, sailing trip and I had great sex. <laughs> so I thought God had answered my prayers, but now I'm starting to realise that because I was sailing around the wet Sundays and didn't have a care in the world and didn't have three grandchildren and a daughter down below me, that um, I was probably in a very good emotional state. Yes. So that's why I had great sex. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> now all I have to do is work on my emotions, manifest a really good guy and have some more great sex. Yeah. <laughs> See, the, the key with that experience is, you know when you go on holidays, generally you're a lot more relaxed, right? And then you are on your day-to-day -day life. And the problem, there's a problem associated with that. Why aren't you relaxed in your day-to-day -day life? So often what happens is we go on a holiday, meet up with somebody, have great sex with them, take them home, and then realise they're not someone you want to live with, <laughs> right? And the reason why that is is because we were just connecting on a physical level. We weren't connecting on a soul level, right? And we were connecting partially on a soul level because we were relaxed. And the physiological response was, is a lot more free, there's a lot more freedom in it when we're relaxed. But we, weren't, we were also ignoring all the other soul connections. You know, all the other soul connections of what type, of what character is this person, and all those things are all just ignored. We just abandon all that for the sake of the sex act. So we've got to be very careful about doing that too, because in the end, if sex doesn't incorporate love, then already there's a law of God being broken. So that's something to be aware of in your own in your own life. So many of you will want to have sex because you want to be, you know, hugged, or you want to be touched, or you you know. But you know you don't love the person, but but that's the feeling you want. You feel like that feeling becomes unbearable after a while, particularly if you haven't had sex maybe for three months or six months or so, 
and, and particularly if you're in a relationship and you haven't had sex with the person you're in a relationship with for that period of time, you, it feels so unbearable that in the end that you just feel like you've got to have it. But in reality what you need to do is feel the unbearable emotion. And that's what we often avoid. And it's the unbearable emotion once it's released that will actually help us with our sex life in the future. Thanks, Jess. Hi. Um, I know that my earlier years, I was driven a lot by that neediness of, with the emotion behind me of wanting to have sex, to have be loved. Now I'm kind of confused with why I even have the desire to want sex. And I feel, um, am I being influenced by spirit now, I'm a bit confused since I've been on this path about sexuality in where my desire is coming from. Is it from me or am I being driven by spirit, another spirit? Well, the truth is whether we're dream driven by spirit or the desire is from ourselves, we still need to recognise it and feel it anyway. So it doesn't really matter whether a spirit's influencing me or not. What I need to do is feel my own emotion. So what are my own emotions about sex? What am I actually feeling? Why do I feel a need to do it? Now, generally, it comes from a, something that's unhealed within us, in terms of, like, if, if we have a desire to have sex without uh, being in a loving relationship, then obviously there is something unhealed within us that causes us to want to do that. I'm, I'm married. I'm not, it's not like I'm desiring another. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing. You can be in a marriage, but it doesn't mean you're in a loving relationship. <laughs> and you can also be in a marriage and, and feel love, but have sexual injuries that prevent you from actually opening up to your partner. So issues of vulnerability and other issues like that, that don't allow you to open up. So on the divine path, what happens, you, you'll go through and you'll come up to an emotion. Like the emotion might be, I'm enraged with men for some unknown reason. You don't might even know why, but you just feel this terrible rage with men. When you dig into it and you let yourself experience the rage and come under the sadness, you might realise that it's actually to do with how Dad treated you when you were little. Or you might realise that it's how women get treated. So it's a general women thing, how women have been treated by men in the past. That rage, when that grief is felt and released, it'll change your sex life with your partner if your partner's a male. It'll just change your, straight away. You'll feel totally different towards the person. And this is why everything needs to be dealt with emotionally. Mm. Gary. Okay. Oh, sorry, Dennis, were you, you have, sorry, Dennis, go ahead. And then we'll go across to Gary. Um, one is a bunch of experiences, one after the other. Yeah. And, um, I have been on a different path at a different time and they have said to it's just have experiences and that has been on a sexual basis. And um, so this week I you know, had those emotions of wanting to have sex and be with somebody and being all of attraction that happens. Yep. And then he's sitting next to me last night wanting to have sex and I just couldn't, couldn't go there. Yep. So, So there's a question in there. <laughs> What's the question? How did that happen? Well, it's sort of like my mind is sort of going, well, no, it's, you know, and this thing about um, damaging the soul confuses me a little bit too. Like, because part of my belief system is still, it's just an experience, um, go for it. And now, you know, the divine love path, I'm a little bit confused as to, well, is this love? But having the experience has still given myself that opportunity to love. So I'm just giving Is it really love? Do you myself. feel really love? <laughs> Did you feel really love? Or well, was no, it that's why I'm... See this well, is the this is the problem. Remember right at the beginning I always say this. What are the two influences on the soul? Truth, Truth <laughs> and error. Right? How do they enter you? They enter you through your... So every experience creates emotions and desires and passions in you, right? 
Is that not right? Every experience. Now, if I choose to have experiences that cause my soul harm, I am going to feel the pain of that harm. If I choose experiences that release pain from my soul, then that's going to be beneficial. So the truth is, yes, this life is all about experiences. It's all about you experiencing this life. Everything that you experience will enter your soul. All of it will enter your soul. But if it's out of harmony with love from God's perspective, in other words, if it's out of harmony with the truth about love, it is going to hurt you. Guaranteed. Every time. And that's the penalty. The hurt. The hurt is the penalty for doing it outside of the truth about love. Now, we can use every single thing that happens to us as a way of accessing the truth about love, or we can use it as accessing or avoiding the truth about love. So I can actually physically go and have sex with someone in total avoidance of the underlying emotions that cause me to do so. Or I can go and have sex with someone in full knowledge of the truth about how I'm feeling about that person. One of those experiences is going to cause me pain. The other one is going to cause me pleasure at the soul level. So there is no problem with you experiencing. But the problem comes when you begin to choose to experience things that are not harmonious with love. And most of us have no idea about love. That's why we're here, learning about love, right? Because we don't have any idea about love, and we're learning about love, and we're learning about God's way of loving. And any way that we choose out of harmony with God's way of loving is going to cause pain to ourselves. And this includes sex, just as it includes any other interaction that we have with people. So, sorry, you wanted to say something for a while? <laughs> oh, no, just the key is not to go into some sort of beating yourself up about having a sexual encounter because like he's saying we're just learning about love and about God and all of those things if we just stay emotionally open and aware with the fact that we have the desire in the first place it's already in our soul whether we act on it or not so we just have choices about how we're going to experience that desire how we're going to release that desire so I had a point <laughs> I think the point is, you know, for so long we've had this set set of morals of, you know, or the rule book or whatever certain people tell us to practice or not practice. But in the end, as we develop in love, we don't need a rule book anymore because it'll all just come from us naturally. Um, and different actions, they might seem diff the, they might seem to be same actions from the outside, but different intentions, like having sex with somebody or having sex with somebody else, it might just seem like sex, but if the intention is to connect on an emotional, a spiritual and a physical level, then that sex is something very different and it's, it can be a love transaction. Um, do you, can you make a point out of what, everything I just said? <laughs> I didn't say any of them, so then they all just came out at once. That's great, mate. <laughs> Did you understand what you were saying? Did I release anything? Sorry? I didn't cause any injury, but did I release anything in love? What do you feel? Yeah. Do, do you feel happy about the encounter? What's your feeling? Did you feel that after you had the sex that you wanted, did you feel that it was actually fulfilling? No, actually it was good to see him walk out the door and say goodnight. Okay. So it wasn't based on love, it wasn't fulfilling. So whatever the need was in you that drove you to have the sex, right, it actually wasn't a pure need. It was something to do with an emotional injury. Because if it was a pure need, it would have had been very fulfilling and you'd want to stay in a relationship with him and you wouldn't be happy that he walked out afterwards. Does that make sense? But the fact that you were happy that he walked out afterwards and that you didn't want to have sex with him the next <laughs> a few nights later tends to indicate that it was driven by an emotional injury. So allow yourself to look at what the emotional injury was. What was it? Was it a desire for approval, a desire for to be validated as a woman, a desire to be sexually um, 
the market where do my looking for it? To be sexually attractive. Uh, you know, what, what desire drove you to have sex that in the end wasn't fulfilling anyway? And the reason why it wasn't fulfilling is because you didn't deal with the underlying emotion and release the emotion. That's why it's not fulfilling in the end. So the truth is you can go out and have as many sexual encounters as you want. You'll find most of them very, very unattractive in the end unless you deal with the emotional causes as to why you go out and do it. And this is one reason why I decided myself to stay celibate for five years. Because what that did was it triggered every single emotion in me of loneliness, feeling empty without a woman in my life, feeling like nobody, for five years, nobody touched me. So if you can imagine what that feels like, not to ever be touched for five years. And that triggered up lots of childhood emotions about my, my mother not, not touching me, not hugging me, and things like that. Lots of emotions come out in that time. So you could choose, I could have chosen to do the same thing by having relationship after relationship, but the problem is they, that would have been just feeding my addictions. Does, does that make sense? And so, and the other obviously feeling I had was, yes, yeah, sex can be an addiction. In fact, sex can be your biggest addiction. So how many of you have sex because you want touch? You want to be held, you want to be loved, you want to be... These are all addictions. That means you're not loved. You don't feel loved. If you want sex to be loved, then you don't feel loved before you begin. Does that make sense? And, the, and having the sex is just feeding that addiction of making the, the illusion that you're loved when in reality, even after the sex act's finished, you still don't really feel loved and you want to have sex again. Right? To feel loved. Because the feeling of being unloved is within you, and until it gets released, it's going to stay in you, generating these addictions. So the problem with sex is that it can be very much driven by addictions. Very much driven by addictions. And the law of attraction will bring you these events and show you your addictions. So let the law of attraction do that. Show you and expose you your addictions. If you know you're not in love with the man, you like him, he's nice enough, and you want to have a sex buddy or whatever, for a, right, then look at the addiction. Does that make sense? While you're in that addiction, you're never going to attract your soulmate. You need to look at that addiction. Feel that addiction. Work your way through that addiction. Can you see how, like, a lot of times we're being addicted to something, and this applies not only to sex, but many other addictions that we have, in order to mask the underlying emotion. But sex is a wonderful, immediate way of masking an underlying emotion. Right? I'd, mu I'd much rather have sex than have a smoke, right? <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> Not everyone maybe feels that way, but, but honestly, we need to look at why, in both cases, they can be addictions. Right? Obviously, smoking is quite obvious that I'm harming my body. It's not always obvious with sex that I'm actually harming myself until after the event, when I actually feel those terrible emotions of, oh, boy, you know, I've done it again, you know, I've entered another relationship that's not satisfying, I've attracted another person who I've interacted with, I've swapped some energy with, but it hasn't been fulfilling, and so forth. So the key is, is for us to actually deal with the underlying emotional addiction that creates that. I think that was my point. <laughs> <laughs> that if you recognise your addictions, you can choose to recognise the addiction and resist the addiction and deal with the underlying emotion, which can work in some cases. But in some cases, if you recognise the addiction and you, you just observe and allow yourself to feel your emotions while you're satisfying the addiction, you can also, in the end, the addiction loses its power. Yeah, see, I don't agree with Mary, actually. <laughs> no, it does work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if sex is a good example, but... It, uh, yeah, but see, like, the, the way I view it is, if you're going to choose to do something that also causes soul damage to you, then in the end, you're going to be also then paying for the soul damage. 
And I guess you're damaging someone else's soul. And you're damaging someone else's soul too. So look, for instance, if I enter a, a, an interaction sexually with another person because of an addiction, but I know there is no love in this interaction, it's just a sexual interaction, then I am damaging my own soul while I'm working through the addiction. You know, no, no, yeah, you're right. Where I think I was thinking more about things like sexual projection and when yeah. people are like entering sort of quasi-sexual interactions, they're not actually having sex, but you, to recognise the sexual interplay that goes on in your everyday life can be quite powerful. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely. So, so in other words, face up to the fact that I'm attracted to five women today, what actually happened, go home and talk to your wife about it, let the emotions come up, and you'll work through lots of issues. Do you know what I mean? Face up the fact that you did have this attraction. But you don't have to act on your attractions. It's a bit like many of you, as you go through your emotions of anger, will feel like murdering someone. You will. I can guarantee you, you will. Right? Don't do it. <laughs> and if you relate it the same way to the sexual things, many of you will feel like having sex with this person, that person, this person. Right? Don't, you don't have to do it. You can actually look at it, look at the emotions that are going on within yourself without actually doing it. Like, don't deny the desire. Don't That's deny the I mean. desire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, don't deny the desire. Because you deny the desire, you're never going to find out the answer of what's going on inside of you emotionally. But if you act on the desire, you are in the potential region of harming yourself if you're acting out of harmony with love. When you're acting in harmony with love, then you are going to benefit yourself. So let's say you sit down with a guy and you say, I want to have sex with you, but I know. You can actually have these discussions, you know. You're allowed to say things like this to people. <laughs> but I do want to have sex with you, but, but I know that I don't really love you. And I've learned that actually if I enter this transaction with you, I'm going to <clears throat> feel really bad about myself afterwards. So, you know, what do you reckon, why are we attracted? You know, what's it, what, let him say what he thinks about you and let yourself feel, oh, that's what I'm attracted to. You make me feel really good. You make me feel safe. You make me feel secure. You make me feel like a woman. You make me feel whatever it is. That's why I'm attracted here. And that means underneath that, that you don't feel safe and you don't feel secure and you don't feel like a woman. Does that make sense? And are the, you can identify literally 10 or 15 emotions in one conversation like that if you let yourself deal with it that way. But you don't have to go and have sex with him to identify those emotions. Does that make sense? And by the way, while you're having sex with somebody else, you're not going to be having sex with your soulmate. Trust me. Would you, would you do that? Would you actually have sex with multiple partners? Like, you want to have your soulmate on the side, or you want to have this guy on the side, or... Do you know what I mean? In the end, you're going to attract your soulmate, which is the whole goal in the end of having a beautiful partnership. You'll attract your soulmate, and you'll have a beautiful sexual relationship with them, but not while you're having a sexual relationship with someone else at the same time. So allow yourself to work through the emotional addictions. Now, if your soulmate has passed, then you can choose, to, you know, like my feelings, personal, these are my personal feelings now, by the way, not God's feelings. God's feelings are you can have sex with anyone you want at any time you want, with whoever you want, right? You can do that. But the proviso is what I just said that if you do it out of harmony with love, you, there is going to be some soul damage. If you do it in harmony with love, you'll be fine with it. And it will help you work through things. My personal feelings are, I would rather work through things in such a way to leave me in as much of a pristine state as I possibly can, so that when I meet my soulmate, it's just going to be a beautiful relationship. That's how I feel. But you don't have to feel that way. You've got free will. <laughs> Uh, just wait, if we can wait for the room. Oh, sorry, we were going to go to Gary first. Sorry, go on, Gary. I think you um, answered the answer that before was about the um, spirit, you know, the spirit influence. Yep. If you if you've got a spirit there and you're sort of blaming him for for um, for setting you up, setting you up <laughs> or whatever. Yep. Um, well, that spirit. You've attracted him because he's got the same emotional injuries yes. in the first place, eh? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So you can't go blaming spirits for setting you up and saying, oh, 
yeah, I have sex with five women this week, but it was all the spirit's fault. Right? <laughs> he doesn't make you get up and do it, you know what I mean? You'll only attract the spirit who's got the same emotional injury. Exactly. 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 Spirit that doesn't make you do something else that you don't want to do. Exactly. Remember, the law of attraction operates in order to heighten your emotional condition in order for you to deal with an emotion. That's how the law of attraction works, right? It's there to expose your emotion back to you. So, 20 spirits around would be better than one either. <laughs> right? Because that will heighten your emotional condition even further and you might deal with the underlying cause of emotion. So I don't see spirits as a problem in the interaction. I see spirits as part of the solution to the interaction because the law of attraction is operating perfectly. So you, if, a, if a spirit who's in a sexual like manipulative condition is attracted to you, it's because you're willing to be manipulated sexually. It's just because of that. It's no other reason. So let yourself feel that. When you feel that and release that, that spirit will say, oh, he's not able to be manipulated sexually anymore. I'll go and find someone else. <laughs> because the spirit wants to have the sexual interaction. So he's not going to wait around for a week or two weeks or ten weeks for you to work, for you to change, particularly after you've just released an emotion, which means he can't manipulate you anymore. So he'll just go. Does that make sense? So if spirits are around you and you feel them around you, either leading up to the sex act or even during the sex act, which many people do notice, then it's because of your law of attraction. So let yourself feel what that feels. You might feel shame, guilt, you might feel, you know, lots of different emotions. So let yourself feel. So if there's uh, spirits hanging around, if you have the sex with your soulmate, does that, is there, yeah, what about that? Is that it's the same, yeah. same thing. You've obviously got injuries or your soulmate's got injuries that have attracted them there and it's a matter of you feeling those injuries and working through them. Yeah, so if you just have a what you think, normal sex with your soulmate, it doesn't really matter if there's spirits there or not. I mean, they're going to be there, are they? Or and <laughs> yes, spirits are going to be around you wherever. They can be around you. But obviously they're not going to be attracted to you to get an emotion. See, most of the times they're looking for an emotion, they're looking for a feeling, they're looking for a physical feeling in their spirit body that they can't get where they are. Now, if you don't give it to them, then they're going to go and find someone else who does. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so you don't need to give it to them. The way that you don't give it to them is by dealing with the emotion that causes the attraction, and you won't be giving it to them anymore, and so they'll feel bored. So they'll see you having sex, right? But they will no longer be emotionally or physically or sexually connected with the act. And so they'll feel much more drawn to go to somebody else who they can be emotionally or sexually connected with the act. And eventually, if every single person on earth was in that state, no spirit would hang around on the earth waiting for a sexual connection. Because they would just know, oh, it's impossible, I'm not going to get it here. And they would have to deal with the emotion at last. Does that make sense? So that's where we're headed. And that's why a lot of spirits don't like me. Oh, sorry. Oh, there was somebody else who was at the back first. I forgot my question. <laughs> oh, sorry. And the other front, and then Dennis at the back. I just need a little clarity about the nature of the spirit world. I think I understand that in the spirit world, there is sex. Yes. These spirits that attach themselves to people regarding sexual issues, is that because they are so low that they're still bound to the earth? Yep. Plane, yes. And they don't know they can have this experience in the spirit world. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And they're not in a condition where they can have the sexual experience in the spirit world okay. either. So in other words, they need to grow through and work through some emotions before they can have a valid sexual experience in the spirit world. So rather than doing that, they come back to earth and try to influence and connect somebody. Just like the drunkard who passes into the spirit world comes back to earth and tries to influence people to get drunk so that he can have that feeling. But, the, the but there, you said there's no, no alcohol allowed in the spirit world? There is no alcohol in the spirit world. <laughs> but the way that many of them still think they get drunk is by coming back to earth 
sitting with a person who's drinking right. and feeling the emotions through that spirit, through that uh, silver cord attachment into their spirit body that feel, and they feel drunk. So I've talked to spirits who have said, I am drunk, but in reality they've been drunk through that connection. Why can't they have alcohol in the spirit world? Well, there just is no alcohol in the spirit world, that's it. Well, why does a drunk want to get drunk all the time? It's to avoid his emotions. So he just wants to continue to avoid his emotions. Yeah. So he does that on this. Yeah. There's no drugs in the spirit world either, by the way. That's, that's why a lot of people who are on drugs on earth are, have like literally tens or even hundreds of spirits around them wanting that emotion. And that's why many of them find it so hard to give up because they've just got huge amounts of external influence. If they chose their emotion, they would easily give it up. But each time, it's an avoidance of the emotion, so we go for the addiction. When we go for the addiction, we're surrounded by other people here on Earth and in the spirit world who want the same addiction. So if you're addicted to sex, you're going to have a long line up of people in front of you who you can have sex with, guaranteed. Does that make sense? And spirits will help you tee that up as well. I was talking to one girl, I was talking to one girl, she had seven spirits with her and one man spirit and the man spirit felt her injury and her injury was she felt unloved completely and the only way she felt that she would be loved is if she had a sexual encounter and this man spirit would set up sexual encounters with men in order for him to get off sexually in the spirit world, right? And this lady was totally unaware that this is why she had so many sexual encounters. And she had hundreds of sexual encounters. She was very young. Hundreds of sexual encounters, none of them satisfying to her, but the spirit was enjoying himself. So called cool enjoying himself. Is there food in the spirit world? Um, there is, but you don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> When you, when you have sex in the spare world, is it anything like what we have? No. Uh, what's it's, it like? it's more intense. Okay. See, uh, most of the experiences in the spirit world are more intense than they are here. Like, for instance, eating. You know, for most of you, most, most of you will realise with your taste buds that they're not actually really taste buds in a way. They're connected to your smell. So if you block your nose while you're eating, you know that it's very, very hard for you to taste something. Agree? In fact, I've done a test on this. There was this guy in England who could tell the difference between 5,000 different types of tea. He could tell you the percentages that were in each type of tea and everything. The doctors told him that it was all due to his smell, and he said, no, it's due to my taste. Anyway, what they did is they blocked his nasal passages up from underneath and also front, and he couldn't tell the difference between tea and coffee. <laughs> just because we smell. Now in the spirit world, the way you eat is through your smell. But anyway, that's inside. Yeah, that's <laughs> sex, is, sex is similar though, in that the sexual organs that we have in the physical body are just a reflection of some sexual organs that are in the spirit, in the spirit body. They don't look the same, but they, they, are, they have a similar response to a heightened degree. So you, you do have sex in the spirit world and it is much more intense when you've dealt with your emotions than it is here on earth in the physical body unless you completely deal with your emotions. Dennis. Uh, it was, Dennis was next, wasn't he? Can I ask a question about touch after that? Yeah, sure. <coughs> when I think about... <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to the relationship issue, yep. um, in a, but not as a, a one night stand, as in a relationship. Yep. And if you're if you're actually um, having sex and it's not as it should be, not in truth or what, you'll be you'll be hurt by it. So yes. Yes. What about if you're because you're in a, in a relationship? You believe in truth, but because of your trauma, you're still being hurt by it. What is, you know, where do the boundaries stop? You know, is it you say, oh, this is hurting too much, it can't be a, a true relationship? How does that work? Well, the way I look at a relationship is that it's a beautiful way, particularly if it's a loving relationship, it's a beautiful way for you to work through a lot of your emotions, including 
emotions about sexuality, right? But it's going to require you owning your own emotion at every single moment and living in truth at every single moment about those emotions. So, for example, if you're a male and you're feeling controlled by the woman in the sex act, then if you're honest with yourself, you will stop the sex act and say, look, I feel you're being quite controlling. Right? Now, she might then get angry at you because she's used to controlling you. Right? And then if both of you go underneath those emotions and really look at those emotions, you can work through lots of issues with regard to sexuality and control and what you feel about each other really quite rapidly. And it's a beautiful way of getting closer together. Or you could choose to totally ignore it. You're feeling controlled, but you just like the feeling of having sex, so you ignore the fact that you're feeling controlled. Right? Now, if you do that, that's going to harm you. Because all you're doing is denying yourself. Can you see? Like, so if you act lovingly and you, and you deal with everything lovingly and you deal with everything in truth, a relationship is a perfect place for you to grow spiritually, even if the relationship is not a soulmate relationship. It's a perfect place for you to grow spiritually. And thanks, Tracy. They've done experiments with babies where um, they put them in certain cribs and then certain babies weren't touched or cuddled and those babies actually severely suffered. So I'm, my question is, is, is touch actually a human need, even as an adult? It's not so much the touch that's the need, but the love that's the need. And the way that we, we experience love is through touch. So the issue is really that these babies felt unloved unless they were touched. And so often we grow up with the same emotion ourselves. In our own childhood, many of us have not been touched, but been told that we're loved. So we grow up with this terrible feeling inside of ourselves that unless we're touched, we're not loved. And so we look constantly looking for touch. Obviously, what we need to do is release the emotion, feel, you know, grieve about not being touched in our childhood. Then you will actually feel a lot more within yourself, like you're secure within yourself and loved, particularly by God. And when you feel that, you won't even feel a need to be touched. Does that make sense? So every single need that we have within us, in the end, will be removed from us. And in the end, everything will become desire and not need. Do you see the difference between need? I've brought this up before, but can you see the difference between need and desire? Need is when I have this, oh, I've got to do, I've got to have that, I've got to have that. If I don't have that, I'm just going to die. That's need, right? Desire is feeling completely harmonious with love within yourself. Feeling like, I'm going to go for that, I really like that. And having this beautiful feeling of love towards that, instead of this terrible feeling of, I'm lacking something in myself. So every single lack within yourself is based on an emotional injury, including every single lack regarding touch and sexuality and so forth. So the key is, allow yourself to confront them. Thank you. Desire is created. It's not right. Please. Thanks. So, so actually, uh, desire, desire is your creativity, divine creativity in action. Yes. Yes. The, you know, one, one day we'll have a session just on desire. Desire is such an important thing in your own progression. And, and the reason why most of us have unsatisfactory sex lives is because we don't know how to fully actualize our desire in harmony with love. So oftentimes our desire is very much impacted by disharmonious with love feelings. And that's what causes us to get into so many situations that are damaging to our own soul. One of the keys of your own progression is going to be learning to have a desire harmonious with love every single time. And sex can be like that. And in fact, sex in the one condition of the soul, the soul union state, is like that. You're in a total sexual union all the time but it's based on desire, not need. Yeah. So it's a totally different thing, me desiring Mary, than it is me needing Mary. And you can often feel the difference in the relationship, right? When that's happening, can't you? You can feel like, they're needing me, they're needing me. And it feels like claustrophobic, if you allow yourself to feel it. It feels claustrophobic, controlling, and manipulative. 
But if the person has a desire for you that is based totally on love without need, it feels freeing. It feels totally beautiful. It feels very beautiful. Totally different. To the different emotions, totally different. Kim, you have a question? We're uh, underway again. So. Yes. And I'm, if I'm intimate with someone and I'm triggered and I burst into tears, which I think I'm not probably the only person who this has happened to, yeah. at what point do I say, well, just keep going and I've got to feel this pain? And that could just be me traumatising all over again and that's healthy. Or at what point is it healthy and I need to just learn what it is to have boundaries, which often violation, violated children don't understand that. Yeah. Um, so, when are you re traumatizing and when are you, or when are you actually going into the emotion and deal? Yeah, my personal feelings are um, if you feel like something's happening and being violated and you feel some pain from it, or emotional pain or physical, stop, stop there and then. But go in to the pain of it. Go into the emotional pain, dive into the emotional pain of it. So. So a lot of times what we do is because we're having sex and there's part pleasure, part pain for many people because of these sexual injuries, often what we do is we try to grasp the pleasure emotion and try to push back the pain emotion. But the irony is that if you allow the pain emotion to come to the fore and be released, what's only left is the pleasure emotion. So just the way I see it is view every single time that that happens where you feel like crying, during sex or afterwards, just go straight into it and really let it happen and and don't worry too much about your partner. In fact, I would say don't worry <laughs> at all about your partner because they need to feel their own emotions of the law of attraction of that anyway. So like if you go, if you're crying afterwards as a woman and your partner's going, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? You know, that he needs to work through his own emotions about that. He needs to let you cry and let you connect with that emotion causally. So let you connect with that childhood event, generally, is the way to go. So you're right, though. If you just persist and try to push yourself through it, you'll find often that you don't actually get through it because the causal emotion is still there underneath the surface. And so the next time you have sex, a similar thing happens, or a few times a day on the track, a similar thing happens. And what we want to do is get away from that. What we want to do is get to the point that Every time we have sex, it's just a blissful experience. But the only way that's going to happen is if we release the emotion that causes it to not be a blissful experience. I think the, it's a blurred line for me, maybe for others, at what point are we going into emotion? And is our fear of doing that because we're actually aware that we've been, we're afraid of re-traumatising? Going into emotion is going there again, you know? Yeah. 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 The the key is there going to be in the result. So a lot of times we won't know until we've finished feeling the emotion. And the key the key is that when you feel the after the emotion has passed a feeling of peacefulness and you feel your law of attraction change, then you know you've dealt with an emotion. Oftentimes though what we're doing is we are in that fear place of trying to choose between am I going to re traumatise myself or not? The, tr the truth is, I believe, you cannot re-traumatise yourself unless you put yourself through exactly the same experience. So, in other words, if I was raped as a child when I was five, and then, I, then I'm in a sexual encounter with a person, then I say, stop, and he says, no, no, I ain't stopping, now I'm re-traumatising myself. Does that make sense? Because now I'm actually in a space where I am getting raped again. But if you say, stop, and he says, no worries, and he stops, go into the emotion and connect with that childhood event which will release it, that's not re-traumatising yourself. That is actually releasing yourself from that emotion in the end. So allow yourself to experience that. Yes? Okay. Does, does your, can your soul actually control the amount of hurt that you receive at one time? You know, will, it, will it look after you in that way? Automatically. 
you, you, your soul is totally incapable of harming your body with emotion, aside from when you deny emotion. So in other words, you can't die from experiencing your emotion. You can only die from the denial of the experience of your emotion. All right? Now that's quite confronting a lot of people. You cannot die from experiencing your emotion. You can only die from the denial of the experience of your emotion. So what's a heart attack? A heart attack is the denial of a heap of sadness which causes the suppression of all this area here across the heart chakra and eventually causes the clogging up of all the arteries in that area and eventually you have a heart attack. That's the denial, of, that's the result of the denial of emotion. But a person who has heart problems, if they start crying, they're not going to harm themselves if they're crying about causal emotion. In fact, what they're going to do is free up the chest area, which actually gets everything operating properly, and all of a sudden, within a day or two, you can find things a lot better. I've found, and I've told this to you before, parts of my body go into like deep pain because of denial of emotion, and then within two days of dealing with emotion, be completely healed again. So if that's the case, you can do that with all parts of your body. What's the difference between a thumb and a and a you know kidney and a you know they all have a replication process of the cell structure, which is all based on your emotional condition. So if you let yourself feel the emotion, you will get into everything possible and heal yourself in the process. controlling is only when you are getting the other person to do what you want for the sake of your own satisfaction. Physical satisfaction. Physical satisfaction or otherwise. Like, um, for instance, you might want a deep soul sex and you're allowed to have deep soul sex. But if the man only wants physical sex, you're of course allowed to say no. Right? You're allowed to do that. There's no harm in that. And um, obviously, if you're like already engaged in the sex act and let yourself work through the issue like what's going on if you're not if you're not like like i feel that there are there are times when i've stopped having sex with mary in the middle of it because of an emotion that one of us have felt and i've said no i can't do this anymore we've got to do with this emotion now if the emotion is you're not receiving any love from the person and you're just feeling the physical body banging against you, then obviously that person's got some issues to work through and you've got some issues to work through with your law of attraction about it. Does that make sense? So so stop the act, work through the issues. Just with um, like, you know, female and male, the differences in arousal. No, so I'm sorry I don't agree with any differences in arousal. Um, one thing I'd like to say to all of you is this difference between male and female differences in arousal is totally dependent upon intergenerational emotions. Do you know what I mean by that? The generational emotions are men do not have um, injuries regarding being abused by sex generally. They, have, they were the abusers. So they don't have too many hang-ups about getting aroused they have a lot of problems about treating the woman lovingly, generally. The women have had many, many, intergener in, intergenerationally, every generation of women has generally been quite abused sexually, right? And harmed sexually. And because of that, in many women, there is this deep anger and rage towards men, understandably so. The key is to not take it out on the man you're with, but to actually deal with it emotionally to actually release the emotion. When you release the emotion as a woman, 
your arousal and your orgasm will happen just as fast as any man. Right. No, it's emotional. The reason why it's emotional, most women are not getting a soul connection in sex and are more sensitive to a soul connection in sex than a man. The reason why is because the men were the abusers and they are less connected to the soul condition than the woman is. So why the woman... So the feeling from the woman... The reason why the woman is finding it so hard to become aroused generally is because of all of these injuries about being abused and about being hurt and wanting a deep soul connection and not getting it, right? And this is where the man needs to work on. The man needs to work on why he doesn't want to give a deep soul connection, why he just feels that sex is a physical act and so forth. When both of them work through those issues, the woman will become aroused just as fast as the man and orgasm just as fast as the man. And have the same libido. That's a bit of a shock for some. Yeah. But it's understandable, isn't it? Like, obviously, in a soul union state, you think about it, there has to be the same amount of emotions going back and forth between the woman and the man. So if that's the case, all of those sexual injuries would have to be healed and would have the same response. In the end, in the soul union state, you will have the same response to every stimuli as your soul man. It doesn't mean you're one person in the sense of physical person, but together you are one being, one entity, in the way you interact with everything. I, w I do want to mention, rather than having some more questions, I do want to mention some of more of the law of attraction things under the injuries, because it's important that we relate these later to how to deal with these injuries. Does that make sense? So if there has injuries, we need to firstly recognise what an injury is. And so I want to mention a few more. So can we look at the contraction of sexual diseases? Sexually transmitted diseases are the result of this huge shame in the human race about sex. And so all of the sexually transmitted diseases that are around today all have relationship to sexuality and how we view it emotionally. So if you've contracted a sexual transmitted disease, let yourself feel emotionally what the shame is all about inside of you. Does that make sense? And you will find, when you do that, that you'll be able to actually heal the disease without any form of medication. Now, I'm not saying to you, don't do medication if that's what you want. I'm saying to you, don't ignore the underlying emotion that causes the attraction. Does that make sense? Yeah. With the sexual transmitted disease. Yeah. Um, what's next? Sexual addictions, promiscuity, nymphomania, one night stands, exhibitionism, and masturbation. All right, sexual addictions. I'll put a few down there, all right? Sexual addictions are an indication that something is unhealed within us. So if we're a male and we're addicted to masturbation, so we might have sex two or three times a day with our partner, but on top of that, need to masturbate as well. Right? Now if we've been in that position, and by the way, I have been in that position myself at some point in my history. So when we're in that position, what we need to do is look at what the emotion is. Now the emotion inside of me at the time was a deep feeling that I was unloved and, and no amount of sex could cure it. Right? And it was an addiction. And it's a matter of actually working your way through that emotionally. Does that make sense? Letting yourself feel about that emotionally. If you feel promiscuity, so in other words, you're having plenty of sex with the person you're with, but you've just got to go out and find another one to have sex with, then there's something going on emotionally. Let yourself feel that. That's the law of attraction. Let yourself feel that. Right? What is going on emotionally? What causes me to do that? With, like, nymphomania, never being satisfied with sex and constantly wanting sex as a result. Often that is a combination of our own emotions of being unloved, this terrible feeling of a lack of love inside of ourselves, added to some attractions with some spirits that just cause us to keep going and going and going and going sexually, never feeling satisfied. So allow yourself to feel what the law of attraction is bringing you. There is something unhealed inside 
It's actually. Does that make sense? To let yourself feel them. What's next? Unloving sexual practices to obtain arousal. Mm. So, so what do we need to do to get aroused? Now, for many of us, there's this really common viewpoint today of it doesn't matter what happens inside of your head. Right? That, by the way, is not God's viewpoint. But it is a viewpoint of man. So in other words, with sex, a lot of times, like we're having sex with one person, but we're thinking about the other person that we really like to be having sex with, right? And that's the only thing that it makes us get aroused. What, what are we ignoring? Well, firstly, we're not love, are we? We're not being love at that point, right? We're ignoring some major emotional issues with the person that we're with. We're skipping over all of that. And we're ignoring the fact that we want to be with someone who we're not with. And heaps of grief-based emotions about that. We're ignoring quite a lot when we think about it. Does that make sense? Now, some of you are starting to feel really judged here. You notice that feeling? Right? You feel, you're feeling like, oh my God, like, like, this is getting restricting, more restricting, more restricting, more restricting, more restricting. More restricting. Can you feel that feeling? Uh, some of you are feeling that feeling, right? Well, go with that feeling. <laughs> Let yourself feel that feeling. I'm just telling you the truth about sex from God's perspective. I'm not saying, judging you, and I'm not feeling, saying you can't keep doing what you're currently doing. But if it's unloving, it will cause you damage. That's all I'm saying. Now, things like threesomes, for example, where you have uh, two males, one female, or two females, one male, where one person is being looked after, two people may not. Or there's this, uh, where there's a dominant role in the relationship. All of those have to do with emotional injuries too. Right? They all have to do with what's going on inside of our soul. So let ourselves connect with that. In the end, remember the pristine condition is, here's me, here's my soulmate. I'm going to connect with my soulmate, and it's going to be beautiful, why would I want any other connection? Well, because of emotional injuries, that's the only reason why I'd want another connection. So allow yourself to experiment with the emotional injuries. So if you're in a threesome, what is happening? Like, what's going on inside of yourself? What's the feeling? Why are you doing it? Is it making you feel powerful? So if it's two men with one woman, is it, if it, and you're the woman, is it making you feel powerful? Is that why you're in this transaction? Because you want to be sexually powerful, which means that you feel that you're not. All right. What emotions am I avoiding in these situations? Allow yourself to feel about them. You know, many times we use sex to punish, don't we? Or control. So we use sex like, there's this, often this feeling of like, I'm going to have sex with you, but only if you give me something. It's a feeling. It's not a, something you maybe say. Does that make sense? So let yourself feel the feeling. Let yourself feel the feelings and work your way through the issue emotionally. Let yourself do that. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. yeah? So just to clarification, Adrian, yeah. are you saying that all of all masturbation is no, not at all. If you can't touch yourself, then why would anybody else be allowed to touch you? It's just if it's excessive. No, if it's driven by an emotional injury. Remember, everything can be good in itself. If it's driven by emotional injury, it can't, it's not. Most of these practices are driven by emotional injuries. So if I'm, having a, if I'm in so-called fulfilling relationship with a person and I'm still masturbating, then look at what's the driving force. Obviously, the relationship isn't as fulfilling as what I think it is. There must be something in the relationship <coughs> that I need to work through to, to work through that issue. Does that make sense? And I'm not saying st stop masturbating. You're allowed to touch yourself as much as you want, right? What I'm saying is deal with the underlying emotional injury that causes the addiction to it. And then see whether you still want to masturbate as much. Right? Then allow it based on desire, not based on need. Yep. Is it a natural thing 
for like teenagers to start masturbation as a natural part of life? Certainly. It's a natural thing for a little child of five to start it. Certainly. There's no, no, the problem is that what we do with sexuality is when our little children of three, four or five are playing with themselves, what do we do? We start going down the track of, oh, don't do that in public, or, you know, and we start getting ashamed of ourselves as parents and we get triggered, right? And we're imposing all of these emotions of shame onto our children, and so they're learning to shut down their sexual identity. The truth is they're allowed to play with themselves as much as they like. It doesn't matter if all of you are triggered. Do you know what I mean? So if a little child's in the audience playing with itself and all of you are triggered, well, that's your own emotional stuff. We need to work our way through it and deal with it. Not, not dump it on the child, because when we dump it on the child, what happens? The child grows up, does exactly the same thing, doesn't connect to themselves sexually, is disconnected from God as well. So there's no harm in all of that, none whatsoever. There's no harm in sexual play between, between children if it's not done out of... You know, most of the time nowadays it's done be reflecting parents' emotions, you know. And if it wasn't, if there wasn't the reflection of parents' emotions, that's what we talked about in the parenting discussion, it would be so much better and we, they could be allowed to develop themselves sexually, they wouldn't have any shame about it, no guilt about it. There's no, no reason why a child can't begin a soulmate sexual relationship by the time they're 10, is there, really? Really? Like... If, if a child can be at one with God by the time they're 10, surely a child can also have a sexual relationship with their soulmate by the time they're 10. So why, why do you think differently? Because we're conditioned that, oh no, that's wrong, it's not right, they're not yet... Do you know what I mean? We're, we're conditioned to all these things and that, that's what causes the damage. So can you see how, on one hand, I'm being quite firm about the morals, but on the other hand, how there's a lot of so-called morals that we have imposed upon us that are just not in harmony with love at all. Can I just ask another quick question? Yeah. Not to do with this, I hope it's still on copy. Um, I've got a bit of judgment myself personally on um, um, sex toys yep. and stuff like that. Yep. And so is that because I've got an emotion behind that or um, the other part of me just says that if I need to have that, then um, it's going out of the natural part of sexual enjoyment. Um, good question. Um, here's our soul. We have what type of... So, how do we know the difference between truth and error? That's really what we're saying in the end, isn't it, with a lot of these questions. Well, yeah, is it harmonious with love? Right. right, so if I'm using a sex toy in a way that's disharmonious with love, then obviously it's not going to be to my soul's benefit. But if I'm using a sex toy that's harmonious with love, then it's going to be to my soul's benefit. Now, when we say harmonious with love, harmonious with love of what? Love of the person, their body, love of the environment, love of... Like, there's a lot of loves to consider in this, isn't there? Not just the sexual love. Right? So, so I don't know. I, I don't know how comfortable you'd feel about replacing batteries that go into landfill every day into a vibrator. Do you know what I mean? There is an issue not to do with the vibrator itself there, but to do with the power source and whether it's harmonious with love. Do you know what I mean by that? Can you see how we would actually have to weigh up those things and uh, just ask ourselves those questions? But in the end, what's the difference like of inserting a finger or a vibrator or, or a penis or anything into a person's vagina? What's the, what's the difference in the end? If it's done out of harmony with love, it's going to be damaging. If it's done with love, how's it going to be then? Surely it would be fine, wouldn't it? So allow yourselves to work through those issues emotionally. You can ask yourself with everything the question, is this loving? Is this not loving? Is this loving? Is this not loving? Quite easily, yes. And oftentimes you'll know the answer if you just listen to yourself. Yeah. So if I have a bit of a fear of it, then obviously it is fear love. 
No, is it? Is fear love? No. So if I'm afraid of a vibrator, then I've got some emotional issue. <laughs> Agreed? Can you see that? And I can work through that emotional issue, can't I? And maybe one way to work through it is go and buy a vibrator and, and work out why you're so afraid of the thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're all laughing, but it's very serious. I'm serious. Do you know what I mean? Like, a lot of times this is what we do. How many of you ladies are afraid of porn? Yep. Right? There's quite a few there will be generally. Why? Angry. Okay, so feel the feeling. What, look at some porn, feel the feeling of anger, and let yourself connect to what it's about. And you'll connect to exploitation of women, that, and you'll connect to lots of different emotions that you feel within yourself, and then you won't feel drawn to watch porn, but you won't feel drawn either to be afraid of it. You won't be angry with it either. Do you know what I mean? And when you're not angry with it or afraid of it, it loses its power in your life, and therefore has no, will have no bearing on your life after that. Yeah, because when we're repulsed and angry and afraid of porn, it actually affects our own sexual response. Because right. there's a lot of emotions in there about men and about you know, who we are as women and how we've been treated. So when we're in the sex act, it, it, those emotions come into bed with us. Yep. Yeah. So, so I'm not suggesting we should go out and buy porn, am I? What I'm saying is, anything you're afraid of needs to be confronted. Anything you're angry about needs to be confronted. Because that's all just covering emotions inside of ourselves. So this is a really good thing to do with sex. Start experimenting with what you're angry about, what you're afraid of, and let yourself trigger it. So how many, how many of us feel afraid of oral sex, for example? Right? Or afraid, like there's all different types of sex that we can engage in as a couple, right? Whether we're a male-male couple, or a female-female couple, or an actual male-female couple, there's all sorts of different sex acts you can engage in. Are you afraid of any of them? If you're afraid of them, then look at what's going on there, because it's something that needs to be looked at seriously. If you have fear or anger, it's just covering deeper emotions. So let yourself deal with those deeper emotions. Let yourself feel about those deep emotions. Let yourself work through it in a loving environment. So, if you're afraid of oral sex, get together with a person who's loving you and caring about you and that you love them and care about them and experiment with oral sex. Like, let yourself feel the emotions that you go through with that. What's actually happening inside of me? How do I feel? It feels uncomfortable. I feel like I'm the focus of attention. I feel like I'm this. I feel like this is all uncomfortable. Down there doesn't smell very nice. You know? <laughs> and you just, you know, you'll be able to work through all of these things, right? <laughs> That's not what Mary feels about. <laughs> And in, in the end, you know what will happen? Is that with oral sex, you'll absolutely enjoy the whole process. You will. Right? When you work through all of your fears and all your anxieties and all your other things, you will eventually come up with actually like what is real. And that is this, just this giving and receiving of love that is happening between you. And the same goes with the sex act. The same goes with orgasm. Like, there are so many ways for a woman to orgasm, for example, and the majority of them are not even recognised by people on Earth today because the majority of times there's so many emotions locked up in that region of the body. You know, with regard to anger with men, anger with their own body, shame about their own body, so forth. How many of you ladies feel ashamed of your own body? Like, how many? Quite a few probably will, right? How many of you feel ashamed, don't like men, a man's body? Like, how many of you don't like a man's body, right? Some. How many of you feel absolutely angry with men about sex? Like, how men have 
you know, taken control of the world, it seems, and also taken control of your body. How many of you feel that? Let yourself go through all those emotions and experiences in a loving sexual environment. And you'll release a lot of emotions that cause you to be closer to God. Jen? Thank you, um, are you going to tell me a story? No. What are you going to do? Are you um, going to ask a question? Yes. Um, I feel like I have been made love to all my life and I'm the passive recipient of sexual advances. Yep. Many women would feel this, right? In my law of attraction with Graham, Graham is, can you hear me saying that loud, Graham? Shut down and doesn't make those attractions Advanced. to me. Yep. So in our sexual relationship, um, he's not doing, I'm not the passive recipient, which is profoundly uncomfortable because I've only ever been that way. Yep. And he wants me to come outside of myself to ignite the passion in him. Yep. That's our law of attraction. I have my question is how do you unlearn these lifelong trappings for one little way of putting it? Yeah. Well firstly both of you obviously have opposite injuries. This often happens in soulmate relationship where you get together with your soulmate and you work out actually you have totally opposite injuries. In other words, your injuries aren't compatible. So you don't get along good with these injuries because they're not compatible with Especially each other. Especially when it comes to sex. Especially with sex in this case. This is a beautiful thing to help trigger each of your emotions. Does that make sense? Otherwise you'll just finish up having no sex. We don't. <laughs> and it doesn't feel very good, does it? No, I'm no. going to leave. So, yeah, so, so instead, deal with your, don't worry about Graham's emotions, deal with your emotions about why you do not want to give and why you expect the man to give to you. What I'm saying to you is that I feel like I've been trained. I know you've been trained, but there's an emotion. There's an emotion underneath it. It's an emotion of anger with men, an emotion of, there's, there's quite a few emotions underneath it for yourself. If you deal with that emotion, you will trigger his emotion. Is it a childhood thing? Yes. From parents or do I... Understand? No, it's from your abuse. It's from your abuse, darling. Oh. Yeah. It's very hard to get You understand... I understand the event. I'm owning the event. It's very, very hard as a child to get below the event to, you know... How do you feel when the man doesn't give to you and you have to give to the man? How do you feel? I absolutely fury. Okay, the fury covers over the deeper emotion. So go outside, get a punching bag, go outside, express your fury. Why are you furious? And you'll connect very rapidly to what it's about. You know, already know what it's about. Why are you furious? It's, it's grief, it's like being over, overcome, suffocated, and not, not being able to exist. I feel like I'm a non existent. So it's about, it's about sexual rejection, isn't it? Is it? What's the feeling? The feeling itself. So it's grief. See, this is the difficulty. So much pain. Know, like, try and put it into a box yeah, we'll talk about this the next time we talk about sex a lot because we want to talk about how to deal with these emotional injuries. But you identified firstly you feel fury. Go into that fury. Not with Graham, because he's not the cause of it. No, he's lovely most of the time, which makes me even more angry. <laughs> Okay. He was, no, seriously, if he was an absolute shit, then <laughs> I, I, would, I would have some direction 
Yeah, no. If he was if he was an absolute shit, you would blame him and you'd feel totally comfortable doing it. That's the problem. Is that is that in the end you do want to blame him. This is why you're in fury, right? Let yourself feel your fury, go out and really express it, but understand that underneath the fury, like you identified, is this terrible, terrible deep grief that you do not want to feel. And when you choose to feel it, this fury won't happen anymore and you'll feel that grief. And when you feel that grief, you'll also then feel, oh, wow, I'm allowed to express myself sexually. And you might also have to deal with, of course, some shame and other emotions as well based on the abuse. But when you feel those emotions, you'll be able to express yourself sexually and not expect the man to do it for you. But at the moment, there's a very, very strong expectation in you that the man does it all, and you just lay back and enjoy it, right? And but he you has get... the same thing. He has so... the same. He expects me to do it all. So I'm... <laughs> he never asked. He never asked the question. You asked the question. <laughs> for you. The answer for you is get out of this. Like, does he get furious with you? If he does, he doesn't show me. Okay. <laughs> Your fury is capping deeper emotions that you do not want to feel. And I agree, Graham's got some other issues that he needs to allow himself to deal with. Thank you. <laughs> of course I said that in the beginning that you didn't even hear. I said, let's concentrate on your issue. You're the one asking the question. Right? You can't change Graham no matter how much you want to, but you want to. Yes. And that's why you... <laughs> so you can avoid your emotion, Jen. Yes. But I'm admitting it, okay? If, yeah, that's great. That's if great I you're admitting it. If I own it and I sit here in the corner and I don't speak up, then I'm not, I'm not trying to push, push through, okay? Yeah, no, it's great that you're admitting it, Jen. It's great you're admitting that... You want him to change. But that, de <laughs> that desire for him to change means that you can get away with not changing. And that's really what you want too. You he's want to doing the same thing too. Oh, I don't care what he's doing, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Honestly. You don't want to change, so you get furious because you want the other person to change. <coughs> Anger is often because you do not want to change yourself and you want to change the other person, right? It's to do with expectations that are unloving, right? So use the relationship now. I know I'm being unloving. I am just furious with Graham for not pleasuring me up, right? Right? And doing exactly what I want and making me feel good and me just lie there and enjoy it, right? Can I borrow your red fan, please? <laughs> So, so that's how you feel. Admit that. Admit that. You've admitted it. Now go into what's going on emotionally as to why you're so angry. Right? And you'll find it's a lot to do with you want now to control men to do it your way, do it when you want it, how you want it, and it's to do with those emotions that you need to release. When you release those emotions, the irony is, is whether he wants to or not, he'll probably finish up getting triggered and dealing with some of his emotions. See, the reality is I feel that I can't feel sexually whole unless he participates. Th that, but that's an error. The, rea that, the reality is that's an error. At this point, I don't see that. I know. Well, Jen, if you didn't know your soulmate, you can still reach at, mar at one moment with God, can't you? Yes. Yeah. And to reach at one with God, we have to fully accept and embrace our own sexuality and sexual identity. Is that not true? So, in your relationship with God, and to release the emotions, that's all you have to focus on. It sounds simple. Well, the reason why it's not simple—it's not simple. 
The reason why it's not easy, we should say, it is simple, but it's not easy. The reason why it's not easy is because I'm so addicted, in your case, you're so addicted to getting the man to do what you want that you don't want to give that up. Right? And that's why you're furious. Because you don't want to give that up. And admit to yourself, I don't want to give that up. Graham, you've got to do exactly what I want. When I want, just pleasure me whenever I want. <laughs> allow, allow yourself to feel that, right? Allow yourself to feel that. And then go into that emotionally and you'll find there's a lot of rage and anger with men in there. And there's a lot of rage and anger with your dad in there that you need to let yourself express and experience. And this is a beautiful relationship. Like Graham is not being pushed around by you, which is really good, actually. Because that triggers this emotion. <laughs> that triggers this emotion, doesn't it? I'm talking to you. <laughs> yeah. You asked the question. Are you very close? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an injury, Jen. <laughs> Is she Loki? <laughs> yeah, no, I'll let her say, say what she wants. Well, all of us women who find it hard to hear truth from AJ, we all have man injuries. <laughs> Speaking from experience. And by the way, I didn't remotely control that. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, um, if, if I have issues with women, and I'm a male, whatever those issues are, I am going to continue to feel those until I let them be triggered. And so, for Graham, yes, yes, he does have some issues with women controlling him in the past. Because there are some issues with his mum controlling him in terms of emotionally controlling him and causing these sexual injuries, yes. But, but if you want to progress towards God, it's immaterial what he's doing. What's, what matters is... You can be a one with God without him. Honestly. But do I want to? Well, if you don't want to, then there's something wrong with your desire. How, how can you, like, embrace all the wonderful things that you're talking about today yeah. and then accept the reality that you're not going to go there and find a soulmate? For me, that's like walking the path to hell. It's yeah. like, it's hellish, really. But Jen, you've got an emotion about needing to have a man, needing to have a partner. Is that true? Um, I don't know. Remember what he said about the difference between need and so desire? You can't live without one. If you could live well, without one, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get into fury every I time have. you do it. I have lived without one. No, I know you have, but you get into fury every time. It's just with Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Darling, you can be at one with God without Graham. So you can heal all of your sexual injuries without Graham. And also, one injury you will need to heal is this terrible neediness you have of Graham. Right? And it's not loving. It's not love that's based on another emotion. So look at what it gives you. When he does exactly what you want, how do you feel? But he doesn't do what I want. That's the <laughs> You're just saying sexually he doesn't do what you want. Honestly, if you look That's at... That's all I was talking about. Yeah. In all these other different areas, he does plenty of what you want, right? And so you need to look at what emotion is being triggered in you that causes you to feel the way you feel about this sexual interaction. Because it's to do with a sexual injury. And my recommended, me, recommendation to Graham is, don't touch a man. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> of course I'm joking, gee. No, what I'm saying is that no, you're not. I am no, you're joking. joking. No, you're not. I am joking. Jen, the irony is that the minute you deal with this emotion, Graham will feel more compelled to touch you. Yes. And this emotion is a very controlling of men emotion. And that's why he's not compelled to touch you. Now I can talk about with Graham, 
if he asks the question <laughs> from his perspective, yeah, what his emotions? Sorry? See, now that's anger. That's a lot of anger coming from him. Yes, so now you need to do it. He perhaps doesn't want to expose his own sexual life like you do, so you need to also look at that. Why is that? Why do you want to pressure him into doing what you're doing? That's not love, Jen. So if it's not love, look at what's underneath that. What's the emotion? What's driving me to do that? To force another person against their own free will. What's doing it? And particularly to force my own soulmate against his free will. That's not love. Now, perhaps he's feeling that, hey, this isn't loving. I don't know if I can do this if this is not loving. Perhaps that's what he's feeling. And you need to consider that. Does that make sense? Let yourself work through that. Now, it's already 26. Um, I think what we'll do is tomorrow's discussion is going to be all questions and answers, right? About this subject, about the subject of sex and sexuality. So what I'd like to do is perhaps what we'll finish, we'll finish off here today and we'll try and raise some of the issues perhaps that we haven't covered in this outline tomorrow as well, but primarily deal with any questions that you have about the subject of sex and sexuality and we'll start looking at injury-based things that are going on as well. Anna, you want to... Have you got any more handouts? Um, I printed out a hundred, but there must be more than a hundred people here, so I might print out a few more. Yeah. Um, so what, what we'll do is, uh, is that'll be tomorrow's discussion. And um, So if you're too uncomfortable to bring it up publicly and you want to write it anonymously, please do that as well. And I'll look at those as well and bring them up during our discussion tomorrow. But thanks for your time today. Thank you.